afternoon. Welcome to this month's Everyone Has a Voice. Uh, the Brockton Library presents. Um, we'd like to thank Mr. Paul Engel, director of the Brockton Library, for giving us this space to um, say our words. Um, we do have our features in the house. Our student feature, Ms. Caitlin Shannon from Massasoit. And Mr. Rick McIntyre will be our feature. Ooh. Yay. <laughs> and we do have a small but intimate open mic, which I will start off with. So um, I was with a few students a couple of weeks ago, and we were um, going over some poetry, and out slipped one of those words. And I was like, oh man, because I haven't done that for a long time. And I just thought in the back of my head, I goes, where's the money jar? Does anybody remember when they were a little kid, they had a money jar? Anytime you said something, money would go into it. So I said, there's a poem there. So I went home and lo and behold, I wrote a poem called Where's the Money Jar? When I was growing up, there was a jar in the kitchen by the door. The jar top sealed shut but with a slit down the middle. Underneath the jar lay the Holy Bible. Now, this glass was for the whole family and for all to see. When our tongues would slip and out came a word or words that disrespected or that were deemed obscene. Profanity, you know. The swear word, vulgar, curse, four letter word, the dirty word. My mother would stop short and in her stern voice, not the motherly voice of comfort, would eyeball me with these three words that made me feel so small. Empty your pockets. My father would just look at me, fold his arms, and I would shuffle off to the kitchen no matter how far as time slowed to a stop. My hand would reach into my pocket and like a shovel would scoop up the coins that I had collected. One by one in would fall George, who never told a lie. Honest Abe, Jefferson and Franklin, authors of the Declaration of Independence. Roosevelt, who led us out of the Great Depression. And Kennedy, ask not. And if it was a good day, Lady Liberty would fall, would fall in. How profane. I am older and supposedly wiser, but every once in a while my tongue will slip and I will look to the heavens and slightly reflect. Where's the money jar? Automatically, my hand will sink into my pocket. Please welcome up to the open mic, Mr. Don Orr. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm working on a program at the Brockton VA where we try to step outside of ourselves and get out of our comfort zone. And the poetry I'm going to read today is definitely out of my comfort zone. It talks about a subject that's uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, these poems are about depression. In uh, 2002, I was diagnosed with bipolar and depression and um, anxiety. And I dealt with it for a long, long time. And it was an experience I'll never forget. And by me stepping out of my comfort zone today, hopefully I can reach out to someone who's going through such a trying time and hopefully they can get some help because this is nothing you want to do more than once or twice. The first poem is called Lost Again. The skies are gray, flowers are dead. No one to talk to but voices in my head. Rivers are black and have no flow. There is no sun to help anything grow. I stand alone in this barren land, my life gone by like wind in my hand. 
tombstones rise and laugh at me, death and pain is the way it should be. You'll notice that these poems are very short. At the time I was in the midst of my depression, I had everything I could do to write down a phrase here, a word there, and it was very, very trying. So the fact that these got written at all is a miracle. Um, the second poem is called So Tired. I'm so tired, words rattle around in my head, absorbing all around me the essence of life and arguments left unsaid. I'm so tired of holding it in, afraid of what if. Mountains from molehills, explosive outbursts, my brain puking, guilt and pain, and playing make-believe. I'm so tired of living a lie, drowning in tears, wanting to die. Thank you. Thank you very much, Don, for sharing. Um, our next poet coming to the mic, I know this is her first time reading in front of an audience, and I know for a fact that this poem is very near and dear to her heart, so please, um, with an encouraging applause, please welcome Mary Fox. I just want to apologize ahead of time. There may be a few tears through this. <laughs> April 13th was the 20th anniversary of my mom's passing. I want to tell everyone about the loving, caring, and strong woman my mom was. This poem is titled, How Do You Say Goodbye? It was the middle of December, 1998. My mom called to get us all together. We all thought it was for Christmas, a little early, where the family got together to party, laugh, and have a little to eat and remember family memories. Then we heard those dreaded words, cancer, stage four. After the chemo that almost killed her, she told us no more, five months left. She was my rock. How do I go on without her? Who do I turn to in the bad times for love, comfort, and advice? Who do I turn to to smile with and celebrate with in the good times? The days were getting shorter than short. <clears throat> Easter Sunday, all together again. She was strong, laughing, smiling, and happy. However, we all knew she was in pain. Our rock to the end. Her nurse said her end was near. Now hours became minutes. Where did the time go? It was Monday, her bedtime. I couldn't say goodbye. Her motherly instincts became stronger. She saw my weaknesses. She was my strength, my comfort, to the end. She smiled, hugged me, and said, it's not goodbye, Mary. It's I'll see you later in heaven. Tuesday morning, she passed. Now through all life's changes, I think of all that she showed me, all she taught me. She's always in my heart and in my thoughts. My rock forever. Goodbye, Mom. I love you. Till we meet again. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, also, first time on the open mic, and I am real excited to present this poet. He's um, come here about three or four times, uh, never came up um, to read his poetry, but today we get to hear his poetry. Please welcome Mr. Stefan Holliday. Well, I'm not really a poet, but um, I'm gonna, I'll give it a try uh, today. Uh, so, I, yeah, I got two short poems. Um, the first one is uh, just me just uh, 
Actually, it was it wasn't a purposely a poem I was trying to write. It was um, another project I was working on, and it turned out someone said, "Hey, that's a poem." So I was like, uh, "I'll put that on the list." So <laughs> uh, this one's uh, I'll just go with this because I don't really have a title for this. Um, I am an artistic ninja. I can be flexible. I can draw pictures with characters and setting. I can also write stories and poems. The hand is as quick as the mind. My talent can bend back and do flips, is cutthroat and suicidal if caught, with the mission in mind. So um, that was based on the picture where uh, I was, there was a picture of me doing a, a back bend. <laughs> I feel like doing it right now. <laughs> like um, one Halloween, <laughs> and um, I was dressed in a, uh, a ninja shit suit. <laughs> so uh, that's what, that's why I came up with this. And I'm also an artist. I usually draw. Um, all right, so here goes the second poem. Uh, this was me thinking one night, and I want to turn my thoughts into a poem. So uh, here it goes. I don't really have a... Well, I, I think I call this I Remember. All right, so this is called I Remember. I remember feeling guilty. I remember feeling like I was the only one. But then something happened. Something went wrong. Exhaustion overcame fears, and you are left at the mercy of the teacher. There is no turning back. Was the choice to be chosen not obvious to us? What I knew was already known. What was a rush was a detour. A race race in vain because someone's heart was in a dirty place. I could not reach the escape when it was in my face. There was something wrong with my faith. Then you realize it is too late and something amiss. All the time spent with the energy I had was in vain. I teared up my sketchbook because I was separated from my past. I could not put into words so I hate it when my mother asked, what was real turned fake? Cause there is no love in the hate. Good isn't good enough, and all I know to do is give up. Uh, I was, <laughs> I was someplace last night. I was, I just woke up and I was thinking, and um, I, I just wrote it down. So um, there, there's my debut. Uh, <laughs> So thank you, Stefan. Today you are officially an artistic poet. How about we put it that way? So um, one of the reasons we created Everyone Has a Voice is, of course, to give everyone a voice. Uh, from Mary to Stefan to Don, myself, uh, but also to give students in the Brockton area um, a chance to um, have their voice. Um, and their experience. Um, so today I'm pleased to welcome to the open, to the feature mic, uh, Ms. Caitlin Shannon. Ms. Caitlin Shannon is a student at Massasoit Community College looking to transfer to a four year university after this semester to a major, to major in Middle Eastern archeology, span okay, and anthropology, so. Ken has been writing poetry as long as she can remember. She is president of the Creative Writing Club at Massasoit and an editor of Massasoit's literal, literal journal, The Lantern. Working on campus as a writing tutor, she is in the early stages of assembling a chapbook of her own poetry. Caitlin considers herself an LGBT poet. I believe that in the words of Mary Oliver, Poetry is meant to be heard. And right now, we get to hear Caitlin Shannon. Uh, so 
So I have four poems today. Um, three out of the four focus on kind of the feeling of putting everything into a relationship and feeling kind of a little empty afterwards. So my first one is called Fracture. Like I'm some kind of house to live in. For you to peer through the windows from behind the curtains, whispering about the neighbors, taking axes to the wallpaper, bearing the framework until nothing but shivering timber beams are left. You have desecrated my home. The door is locked. The shades are drawn. I have let you manifest inside my heart and you have thrown your blows against every surface, splintering hardwood floors, caving stippled ceilings, undoing every long day of work I have put myself through and leaving. Tool belt slung over shoulder. When my sun sets and you no longer find pleasure in swing swinging at my shards in the dark, Striding through my garden plots as you walk back to your car. Thy words shall not condemn me, but I condemn myself. I am a house that all my lovers live in, illuminating windows in my chest that do not stay for long. I do not need them. I can stand empty and still stand. Um, my next one is really more of a collection of thoughts than a poem. Um, it's called How to Forget Her Touch. How to Forget Her Touch. I read once that it takes seven years for all of your skin to be completely replaced. To accelerate this process, get a sunburn so bad that you can peel away what she touched. How to forget her touch, I have allowed her whispers like gnats to burrow to my brainstem, rewarding my cooperation with condescension and laceration, bites I cannot scratch without tearing my mind from its casings. How to forget her touch, I'd like to say that my heart is more lovely for you having touched it. But what I really mean is sometimes your hands still squeeze around it until flowers bounce out the cracks. How to forget her touch. How weird is it that we keep becoming single at the same time? How weird is it that I keep falling into you like an old habit? How to forget her touch going from every day for years? Texting, hi, how are you? Good morning, I missed you. Did you dream? I have class, I have to go. I'll see you later, I love you. Hi again, how are you? I'm sorry, I took so long. I miss you, good night, I love you. Good morning, I missed you. To radio silence. Nothing but an empty bed. No winter vacations in Canada, and I still sit writing poetry about you that you do not deserve. How to forget her touch, my heart, every part of her soul that you held in the palm of your hand, now blackened and rotten. How to forget her touch, fill your life with work. I dug a hole in my backyard every night after work for a week and laid in the bottom for an hour, trying to convince the earth to take me back, to swallow me whole, but she refused and all that remained were blisters and splinters, dirt under my nails, small rocks in my hair. But dear God, it was better than thinking of her. Um, my next one is... Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, my next one, this is the last one about relationships, I promise, um, is called Gull is Empty and the High Tides Are Here after Shakespearean quote. Um, I, like a seagull, regurgitate my love to my lovers with each time 
I grow more weary. With each time, it grows more thin. I do not freely give it as I should, becoming guarded regarding what I spill to and for them, wheeling precariously in the air, refusing to land. I would have given everything, the damn blood inside my veins if they so requested. The current, she is waiting, and I have no distraction. Sea urchins by any other name would sting just as sweet, lather, rinse, and repeat. Um. <laughs> And my next one is my longest one. Um, this one I have been working on for a very long time. It's very close to my heart. Um, it deals with more of being who I am and looking how I look with little to no like cultural representation. It's called um, Butch and Butcher. Um, they're more scared of you than you are of them usually spoken in reference to spiders, but still relevant nonetheless. Somehow I butcher my social life, swinging harshly and pulling back in a constant competition of who can push harder and I can always pull back faster than they can push me away. I am both butch and butcher, my past and present selves swinging from hooks in a walker and freezer, carmine, always cold to the touch and always alone. I cling to dyke because it's something I can be by myself. I dig my nails into the side of butch because it doesn't have to include another party in order to be true. I search for light in every interaction, meaning in every empty bed, solace in every pair of eyes that meets mine, but all of the above are empty to what I hope to find. And I can never seem to make enough art to let it all out. There will always be a tight knot behind my ribs that I cannot seem to pull apart. And I can never get the words out right. My brain a highway, two lanes closed for construction. The thunderheads still swell at my horizon. Soured milk, a constant on my tongue. Life butch is a constant battle of is it them or is it me? Am I too much or are they too little? Do they see me as nothing but a living exaggeration? Their stares biting at my confidence with teeth as straight as they are. And I am driving driving so I don't have to think about how lonely that is. So the only thing I have to think about is whether the road in front continues under my tires, going 90 down 3A, wind in my hair, soul alive in my chest, escape within my grasp. But the feeling is fleeting, the freedom impermanent, baptized by the fluorescent tunnel lights with hands heavy and heart hollow, I return. I make jokes about just how dyke I am, self-deprecating because they always land. The gays laugh because they understand, the straights laugh because they're nervous, but I never truly know if the room is laughing with me or against me. Some days it hangs, millstone from each shoulder, and other days it drapes, scarlet sash across my chest. Whiplash from the dichotomy, each day a cacophony of unfamiliar emotions. But I see people like me on the red line together, and suddenly the world and my heart are both sunshine and violets, cardinal feathers and city lights. Do they know how they make me feel? in khaki shorts and denim vests, short hair and silver accents, even their tattoos refusing to be small. The negative space between them, now hallowed ground in my heart. Teach me 
how to wear my pride like an ever-growing tattoo sleeve, butch as my most precious descriptor. With hands light and heart full, I return, born again from my walk-in freezer, standing in the mirror, gazing at who I always wanted to be. Maybe I am not as alone as I previously thought. Maybe who I am is not a performance. Maybe I am not putting on a show to extract a response. Maybe you have no idea that cutting my hair feels like coming home to a house I never considered I could ever actually want to live in. Like hot coffee on a cold morning like how a freshly lit cigarette smells different from the stale smoke braided into your clothes. Butch, but no longer butcher, I scrape myself from the pavement and continue on. And I am long overdue to bite my tongue, but maybe my existence is not begging for your commentary. I am simply living in my skin and it is none of my concern that it's getting under yours. So today we were just taken to church by Caitlin Shannon. We were in the first grade and Caitlin Shannon was our teacher and we learned so much. Um, Thank you, Caitlin, that was, that was wonderful. And hopefully next year when you have your chat book, you can come back as a feature, feature, okay? Um, so I want to introduce our feature feature today, Rick McIntyre. Um, I just want to say a couple of words that I've known Rick for 20 years now, and it's been an amazing journey to, to be with Rick um, from the Cantab Lounge to the Lizard Lounge, to um, AS220 in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, every time Rick does a performance, it's like the first time I'm watching, and I've, and I've seen um, Rick many, many, many times, and I always come out being a better poet um, and being a better person. Poet and author Rick McIntyre is a three-time member of the National Poetry Slam Team and co-host of the Slam-Oriented Poetry at the Boston's Cantab Lounge. Mr. McIntyre wa waxes humorous with his muse appearing as the host of his own Got Poetry Live at Ocean State Blue Coffee House on Thayer Street in Providence, Rhode Island. The self-proclaimed follower of the throw the money changers out of the temple, Jesus, his sometimes serious, sometimes irreverent host keeps the amazement flowing. In addition to his books of poetry, Mr. McIntyre has been published in Short Fuse, an anthology of new fusion poets, 100 Poets Against the New World Order, Ninth po Position Magazine, and the Worcester Review. Author of two collections of poetry, After Everything Burns, and The Man at the Door. Please welcome Mr. Rick McIntyre. We have to update that resume. Uh, the Blue State Coffee House still exists, but um, we don't have a poetry thing there. <clears throat> I'm going to start off with something to get um, my blood moving a little faster uh, and maybe hopefully entertaining you at the same time. How to bake bread in 12 steps. Step one, don't even try this for decades. Learn to fear the process. Step two, don't listen to step one. My God, it has issues. I'm step one, I always get to go first. Forget it, who needs the negativity? Step three, put some dry ingredients into a bowl. Realize you're recently divorced. You don't have dry ingredients or a bowl, so you rush out to the store to buy those things. You could have shown up at the potluck tonight with just a bag of chips, but you had to brag a little bit. I'm gonna bring fresh baked bread. I know how to do that. Liar! Step four, 
just because it's so crazy, it might work. This one time in your life, try reading the directions first. Step five, suspect the recipe is lying to you. It wants you to fail. There's no way that much water is enough for all much flour. Oh my God, this is another bad life decision you have made, poet. You cry, you cry right now. Step six, realize that your sweet, sweet tears are just what the yeast needed to grow on. Say to hell with the yeast, it doesn't love you. Put as much fucking water as it takes to roll the dough into a ball and then roll yourself into a ball. Rock gently. Step seven. Put some flour on a cool, dry surface and then put on some long rubber gloves. The flour is so the dough doesn't stick. The, the gloves, well, you're not gonna wanna leave fingerprints after this. Step eight, mold the dough until it looks a little bit like whoever hurt you this bad. Add fists. I don't know how many, it's your rage, add fists. Step nine, let it go, man. Will you let it rest? I mean the dough. Let it rest for about 30 minutes. By then it'll have dropped its guard. There's no way you're done venting yet. Step 10, now it's time to show that the dough, dough that step eight was just a skip through sunny lollipop land compared to what's coming next. Roll your sleeves up and regress approximately 867 years. Get medieval on it, step 11. Then stop blaming everything in the world for what's wrong with your life. But then remember, you forgot to forgive yourself for being human. You also forgot to preheat the oven to 425 degrees, but it's not a big deal. There's no need to get upset about it. I don't think we have to hear that Adele CD again. Step 12. Take the dough and separate it into two parts. Put both of those in the oven. And while you're doing that, think of all the pain you thought that would never get better and did and use that to transform these things into th food you will feed to people you may not even know, body and soul, and then give yourself some break. You did it, you made bread, it gets easier. Uh, picked a weird selection of poems, all that sort of maybe are about the weekend and then maybe an Earth Day kind of poem thing. Maybe, maybe. Not making any promises. I'm also looking for the poems. Oh, come on. All right. Uh, this first one I want to read uh, is a character uh, based poem, and it was uh, based on Lucy from the comic strip Peanuts. It's called The Doctor Is In. Everyone thinks I'm a bitch, and maybe I am. It's ugly work, and I'm just the big sister to do it. I help people, even though they rarely see it that way. They say, you're crabby, or ah, you tricked me, again. They don't see how this benefits them. I do. That's why I'm the professional. That's why I get paid the big nickels. Because the work just walks around on legs in my neighborhood. From the kid with serious hygiene issues and hydrophobia to the genius who sells himself short by never moving on from a toy piano. I wish I could tell them what I imagine for their futures. I, I wish they would listen. I worry about them, especially my brother. It's, it's not his pumpkin obsession alone. It's, it's his letter-perfect recall of Bible verses, the, the manner in which he whispers them to his blanket when he thinks no one is looking. I only threaten to knock his block off because I love him. I want him to be okay, and I just worry he never will. And I don't think he should hang around with Charlie Brown. I don't think it's good for either of them. Charlie is like a hollow stomach ache. He naturally attracts all the loser luck in a given area like a vacuum. He sucks the fun out of everything because he's convinced he's doomed before he even starts. 
My brother believes he can save him by feeding him God in small pieces. But I tell him, Linus, don't assume you can feed yourself. What are you going to do for work when you get older? And then he'll get that closed off look in his eye, hug the blanket tighter, and I know I've lost him until he takes the thumb out of his mouth. I wait to see whether he will quote from the New Testament or the old, lately it's been the book of Revelations. I've tried to talk to my parents, but all they say is mwah, 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 like that would help. Linus has memorized the Bible, but these days he needs to hug it close. Both of them wrapped tight in the blanket, anticipating storms. I whisper, God didn't give you this life for you to lose it to obsessions and tests. You don't have to fill that hole inside. Let yourself be hungry. You won't die. Okay, I know you're a quiet audience. Let's, let's have, you know, you don't have to clap, but if you don't like the poem and you're inclined to throw things, <laughs> just throw that way. <laughs> it will still hurt in my heart. <laughs> but, okay, uh, this is a, a, what we, we call an ekfrat, a poem about a painting, which was, uh, I picked, uh, the, this is the first one I ever wrote, so I picked the Mona Lisa, because, you know, why, why start down with the puppy playing poker pictures? Go for the top. So this is called Leonardo Loves Me, This I Know. After the Mona Lisa. Slight smiles are like chameleons. If one showed itself to you, how would you know that's the real thing and not the camouflage? Leonardo asked, do you love me? In that nano moment before he froze my image in his mind and started to paint. And at that point, he was stuck with me and that look on my face. And he would have to paint it, just like that. If you think I'm being mean to Leonardo, I'm not. He loved these little jokes we shared, and he loved me, just as I knew he could never love me the way I knew he knew I needed. You see why my smile is so complicated? I knew we would never marry, like I know the reasons, the thousand reasons why that was so. Our wedding, if such a thing could be, would have made mockery of all the tr too many traditions, made too many new enemies, when all we were trying to do was make something beautiful. We wanted to make beauty bigger, with new wings, its flight plans transformed into the lasting promises that plain-looking girls could hope for classic love. This change will fly all the way to a new science where any small feature, say <coughs> a smile, could make a face remembered for all time. Pretty girls live their lives resting peacefully on mirror knowledge. Ugly girls like me dream of a life where we're beautiful enough. I will live forever because a gay man cared enough to save me just as I am, except better. I will remain myself, mysterious, eternal, and beautiful. So I got a number of poems that explore the idea of God or gods, and um, I didn't particularly choose them because of this weekend, but uh, I also lie a lot. This poem came from a prompt where someone said, okay, for this writing prompt, pretend you are at a convention of minor gods, pantheistic view. Uh, and you are talking to a, a, a one of them who has just lost their last worshiper. So I wrote The God of the Forgotten Gods. When entities have been forgotten, become lost and unfriended, they come to me. In the days before, this was a ritual of certainty and surrender. 
So many God stories are about the ending of things. If you are going to choose only one belief about God's, choose this. Not a single human knows anything. No one has ever begotten an accurate description. They get it wrong. And with a single fabric unweaving inconsistency, the well-rounded, fantastic, and true religion is revealed for what it is, a child's drawing of the indescribable, usually superheroes of some kind who are better and kinder or not. Some are just bigger. And all children know this, the biggers can push the smaller of them down because they can. Of course they worship that. Gods and heavens don't exist unless they do. That's as accurate as any anthology or liturgy gets. What happens to discarded works of men, though? Where do old gods go to die in quiet isolation? They come to me, preservatus, the god of the forgotten gods. They, become, they come because I remember their names when names die. Remember their high holy days, remember the sacrifices they favored, know their essence that a litany of voices is crucial to maintain. I mean, I bring them food they like and sing songs only they and I remember the words to for as long as they can hold their shape. Afterwards, I put them to sleep in grounds beyond the reach of prayer and supplication a place where gods are safe from men. Uh, all right, here's, uh, most of this poem actually happened. That's all the intro you're getting. It's called Nearer My God to Thee. So there I am sitting next to God on the subway. Needless to say, I'm trying to think of anything except all the things I hope God's overlooked, but I just thought of one. Now God knows. I can tell by the way he reads the newspaper upside down, how he clears his throat, the number of teeth he's missing. I've heard stories about encounters with the divine, and I am grateful to be in the presence, but really, I find myself hoping God doesn't somehow know the sheer number of times I've masturbated. This gets his attention. He turns and unto me says, best thing humans invented was the art of kissing. That almost makes up for war, Though if you all spent more time practicing kissing, maybe you wouldn't have so much damn war. It's not like you gotta be omnipotent to see that one make sense. Also, I like that Kevin Smith movie about me, and I'm glad he picked Alanis Morissette to be me. Good singers do it from the heart, and that's all I've ever tried to do. And just like her, some folks get caught up in the wordiness and never really get the song. Say, you don't have five bucks so I could get a sandwich, do you? I've been wearing this body for a day and it feels needy already. Thanks, kid. Infinite power doesn't mean inexhaustible, I'll tell you that. It takes a lot to be all powerful, you know? I set this world up to work and then I step back to let it. Almost everything that happened after that just happened. Light, gravity, dinosaurs, humans, all free will, all of it. But only you humans ever learn to pray. It is beautiful sometimes. Most times it breaks my heart. People ask, do I cry over every lost child? And I do. But I don't give a shit about your religions or your wars. I'll give you this piece of advice. Keep doing what you're doing, kid. You took time to be nice to a toothless old man telling you he's God, and you let him hit you up for a couple bucks. Oh, and it's over 15,000 and counting. You know, the 15,000 and counting. And every one of them is okay. I don't judge those things. 
you got to be good to yourself if you want to have the energy to be good to those around you. Get fed, kid, then feed others. And then he winked and smiled at me with new teeth. And I wasn't surprised at all that he got off at the next station, just like anybody else. I need a t-shirt. I met God and it only cost me five bucks. Uh, okay, this is one I'm s clearly work in progress. <laughs> I'll type a nice fresh copy on and then just look at it before I leave the house this morning. Yeah? You know, some people edit like this, I edit like this. <laughs> this is called uh, Pain Scale for Fossils, and it's after a friend of mine's poem, a uh, friend, Liv Mamone, whose poem was after a poem by Taylor Carmen Salath. So, the healthcare practitioners and I are locked in this dance, and they ask every time, are you having any pain today? And can you give it a number from one to 10? And if this were a poem about math, I would point out numbers can be irrational and some numbers are not real and even the real ones are just symbols. I mean, pick any number, it's meaningless because it is not the pain it pretends to know. Instead, I tell them, I don't think your numbers are the same as my numbers. Level one, this is the pain where you wake up in bed. Me too. But while you call this a sick day, I call it good morning. Time to put on this body insulated in ache, this punishing coat. Pain level two, good morning. Barometer numbers caution rain. Level three, good morning. It's going to rain hard. Four, this pain makes me snap into a confused fracture of mythologies. These arms of mine feel waxen and too close to the sun. I have salt columns for when I walk. My body is a temple in that it's fallen into such ruin. My doctor only speaks to me in dead languages. Level five. This pain is the unsure place, the knife edge, where every spoon is counted and counted again, compared against my to-do list, triaged hourly. Will this become a bad pain day? Am I going back to bed, or will I last the day despite the rain and do everything by the numbers? Pain level six, it is raining. It is always raining or about to rain. I have learned to hate the rain. I write fragile plan lists in pencil only on conditional paper, heavy with caveats and thick with exits if I need them. Level seven, 15 years ago, this was the pain that kept me in bed 18 hours a day. Today, it's just, ow, damn it. But sometime, someday, I know I will call seven my favorite lost world, level eight. It is raining tyrannosaurs, and I swear they are on fire. Detrius settles in layers, new ache thrown on top of an hour, every hour, every 24, every seven. Rain yesterday and today, rain for 15 years now. It will always rain tomorrow. Nine, rain as its own soothsayer, rain as false equivalents, rain as broken numbers because pain can't be digitized, can't be measured correctly unless you are in my body right now. I am having trouble talking because the rain won't stop until it is big as numbers can get. Level 10, end game, extinction event, rain until numbers end. We've been here, 
unicorn has skewered me through the chest cavity. Digitize that. This is a poem I wrote, uh, another persona poem. Um, it's called The Awful Potential. Don't tell me the sins of the father are visited upon the son. I know this. It is my story, full of the hatred of the frightened. Have you heard them cry of my awful potential? And did they call me Frankenstein's monster? They are liars. They lie. My name is Adam, and I am not lovable. I am too unsettling to look at. My skin is not like yours, the living, and I am a stitched puzzle to God. My flat skull, they say, is because God looked down at me and said, man is capable of right and wrong, but this is what all mankind's sins look like given shape. This is a sin so original in hubris, there was no plan for its punishment. This, God said, is not mine. Well, let God hate me. I never asked to be born. But assembled into this world, all I wanted were the same answers, same questions as anyone. Who am I? Why am I here? I was no miracle of motherless birth. I was a mistake stolen into being, lightning in my blood. They still call my father the modern Prometheus. And that is truer than they know. Prometheus was a thief too. Rejected from my father's love, I wandered by night and deep forest, and no one will ever believe me if I told them the story of the girl I found kneeling in the field, picking flowers. My heart was moved. I did not know I had one. So unafraid, she smiled at me, and all my strength went weak. We flew through flowers in the stream, laughing as they swirled until someone in her family screamed and out came the villagers, every torch and pitchfork, one of them, all of them howling of my awful potential of these arms that could break them, a body with no use for blood, a thing that feared nothing about them except fire. So it was behind fire they found their courage and came for me. As they drove me back, I saw deep inside them, saw the truth in their eyes. They dream and wish for miracles and immortality, but they are the children of Cain. They will kill me because that is what they do. Then again, these are people who worship a God that let his own son die just to prove a point, a God that named every angel he watched burn. In great irony, I was driven back home to my father's castle where I was the shape of all his sins revisiting, coming back as my hand on his throat. And I think of the villagers and how they keep hate holy. And I think of my father and everything born of his science and mad resolve. And I look right into the eyes of God and I finally know there is an awful potential behind all of this, but it is not in me. Awesome. Two more bumps. Uh, try to go out on that high poetic way of going out when you know exactly what you're talking about and you're so smooth on stage that people. 
Uh, this is a poem I wrote because a friend of mine posted, you know, all the poets I know, mostly slam poets, but not exclusively, want to write the big poems about hunger and war and racism. And not in, these are not bad topics, mind you, but nobody anymore, and this is kind of specific to slam, nobody wanted to write poems anymore about small details, things like a praying mantis, uh, a, a, a tree, or a typewriter. So... I sent him the praying mantis that saved a walnut tree with a typewriter. <laughs> Haiku, it thought, head twisted sideways and faster than you just missed it, raptorial legs snatch precise elements out of the air, leaving nothing of a wake. There are words and there are no words and then there are words. Mantis considers his brief existence under walnut tree. Every day, Mantis continues taking words from out of thin air, making poetry and leaving no ripple, no proof it was ever there. Tree remains. Tree, uh, sorry, no proof it was ever there after typewriter goes quiet. Tree remains. Tree knows Mantis could have chosen any tree anywhere except events happened as they did. Typewriter sounds incorporate into bark, grow into the small memory of details. There was a Mantis. There is no Mantis. There is a tree that knows what a poem feels. Last poem, last poem of the day. Um, this was written for a friend of mine who never mind uh, remembering to eat, you know, not being into eating breakfast. She really wasn't kind of into being alive. So I just used breakfast as a kind of a way in. It's called the most important meal of the day. If the first thought upon waking is to grieve that you haven't moved away from your skin, Take heart. You weren't meant to surface clean of yesterday. You wear the days like old laundry until even you can't stand the stale stink of funk. It's too early to complicate things, but you can't sleep your life away. You need to leave the false armor of the bed and face off with whatever this day threatens to become. If the voices in your head insult, beat them down with hot coffee and something to fill you up. Your day will mold its shape around this time of first thoughts. Aren't you tired of eating enough for breakfast? Don't you want life to have taste again? How did you ever forget why you cook for yourself? By thinking if I had been different, impossible and good, now see how easy it is for false things to crawl onto your plate and into your belly. So keep your eyes open, keep your fork sharp and ready. Today could be delicious, aim for that. Lose a bad habit, lose yourself in the possibility that you are not done with life, nor is it yet done with you. Clean your plate, eat everything, even the bad thoughts that believe themselves indigestible bulk. The world is full of people who are hungry. Don't you starve yourself by choice. Get out of bed, make the best breakfast ever. Live, damn it, live. First, there were letters, then came words, turned into stanzas that I stood upon, bared my nakedness, opening a new beginning. Those words were never more true than today. We heard from Mary and Stefan and Don and our student feature, Caitlin and Rick McIntyre. I wanna thank Mr. Paul Engel director of the Brockton Library for giving us this space, general manager Mark Lindy from Brockton Community Cable, 
Access TV for recording this. Um, and most importantly, for everyone who came to listen. I hope you take these words and make them part of your day and your year. Thank you very much, and we'll see you again.